Hello, I'm Dr. Nelson. On this series of lectures, I want to talk about quantum biology. I want to talk about some of the basic ideas behind the QXCI development. I want to talk about a whole change in the paradigm of medicine. I want to show you, the viewer, some of the history and some of the ideas behind the system. This series of tapes will be at a very high level of mathematics and also at a high level of science. It's not really for everybody. I hope that you're entertained by it. The, uh, also on this CD will be included a history of different research, including the many parts of the book, The Promorpheus. But if you'd like to get a copy of The Promorpheus for yourself, and here we have it. If you'd like to get a copy of, this is Promorpheus number two. If you'd like to get a copy of this, there'll be information on the CD on how to get this. Uh, as well as on this CD will be much of the text, however, not many of the pictures. So if you want to get the illustration and get the full book, and also if you want to get an autographed copy by me, the author, uh, it's a treatise on quantum biology. And if you like to get a copy of that, there's information on this tape. So welcome to the discussions now on quantum biology. Now, let's explain a little bit more about quantum. We talk about quantum theory. Just what are some of the simple ways of understanding? Number one, when Max Planck first realized that by heating a, br a black iron bar, as he applied more heat, the photons coming off of the bar did not make a gentle, gradual change in energy. They made distinct leaps of energy. He started with the idea of quantum theory, realizing that the, org the basic organization of the universe was not at a continuous level, but at a quantity level. There were certain places where energies at the very most base level of existence, energies are exchanged in quanta, meaning that the basic form of energy is down deep and does not exchange at small rates. It happens very, very tiny, very, very small, but does not happen, at, at, uh, happen in a continuous fashion. This type of exchange is a vibration exchange, an energy. Einstein said that E equals mc squared. Energy and mass are connected, vibration, energy. And that at any time we look at energy, it can be transposed towards mass, and any mass can be transposed into energy. Basically, there are vibration energies. And as we now start to look at the electron, we find that the electron is made up of other smaller particles known as quarks. And as we look into deeply into these quarks, we're now finding out that they're really not distinct particles, but they're more energy fields. And now with QED, we're starting to realize we need to move away from the idea of a particle, a particle theory and a field theory, but realize that they're actually combined and that these things are more of a, of a total quanon idea, more or less like a, a horse who gallops towards you. Around the horse might be a field of dust. If we see the particle and the field as being more or less one and hard to understand where one stops and the other starts, this will allow us to start understanding the world and through vibration and vibrational energy. We also now know with, with quantum theory that when we get down to it at a certain level, as we get smaller and smaller experiments, when we finally get into away from the world of Newtonian dynamics and we get into the world of quantum theory, we're going to find there's an uncertainty. Heisenberg found the uncertainty principle, which nobody has been able to circumvent. At the different levels of uncertainty, we just do not know completely the action of these particles. We can know their position. We can know their momentum. We cannot know both. There is an uncertainty that is not a limitation of our instruments. It is a limitation of existence. That the basic quality or of life is an uncertainty expressed as a probability. Another very interesting factor, what we found is when we get down to that level of uncertainty, we get to, right down to that level of deep uncertainty, we're going to find that there's an observer effect and that the consciousness of the experimenter affects his research. Very interesting. A total change in the philosophy of science is that the mind of the experimenter was now affecting his results. 
At the same time, in medicine, they were starting to find out that the mind of the researcher was affecting his experiment as well. So all of medicine had to shift to the double-blind experiment, where all of quantum physics had to switch to the double-blind experiment as well at the same period of time, because they started to find the observer effect. Why did medicine find it? Because biology is a quantum event. Quantum events are subject to observer effects. The consciousness of the being, the consciousness of the tester, the consciousness of the testee, is part of the experiment and can change the experiment. The mind affects all. When we study the very beginning of life, what scientists have been able to do is take a very purified sphere or container put into it the basic elements of life, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, some of the, uh, all the different capacities that would be here on the planet. They find that, that it, and also with water, making sure that there's H2O involved, at the right temperature, etc., and then adding a factor of lightning, the energy that would be needed to help create molecules. Then we're going to see the formation of amino acids, we're going to find the combinations of different carbons and nitrogens and hydrogens, and, and they're going to actually make some of the very simple amino acids. We're going to find the, the formation of simple fatty acid chains along with the carbon chains. We're going to find that as these things start to develop, they start to form into bubbles. This is what the scientists have found. A little bubble, an amino acid fatty acid bubble, a container, seemingly empty inside. What they'll find is that these, and also inside this, this container, we'll have to uh, put in light. We'll have to put in the different light coming in from the sun. Now, what we will find is that with these little bubbles that spontaneously exist inside this chamber, that we'll find these little bubbles will set up a electrodynamic energy across their membrane that will intensify with the photons of light that as with the QED phenomena, when the light hits these electrons inside this membrane, this will create an electropotential. This is the start of light. This is the start of life. Because life is connected to light and connected to electron transport. And that the light or the photons will supply the energy that is needed to get the electrons into electron transport chains and allow them to accelerate and start the process. This is the simplest of all cells. And it will be light responsive, meaning that it will have a different activity during the day than at night. As night starts to develop, scientists think that maybe the formation of melatonin might have been the very, very first form of DNA. That the melatonin, which has over 256 different types of melatonin, 256 different ways we can take the, and build the same chemical. Melatonin is not simple. Everything in biology is much more complex than we would like to originally think. But melatonin, which has a different action in light versus dark, it's the key hormone of our pineal gland. And this melatonin might have been the first accounting system that would allow these cells to start to develop an accounting of life. What do I mean by accounting of life? Life will have to be able to account for many different things. It will have to be able to take energy in, energy that will come into it as mathematic energy from heat, chemicals, etc., contact with the environment, it would also be able to have to reproduce itself. This type of accounting system will be then established later with the DNA, as the DNA will be able to account for its ability to interact. That leads us to the idea of biofeedback, because we've classified the system as biofeedback. We talked about the 85% degree of accuracy. This, is, this means the system cannot be designed as a medical system. We cannot hook up the QXCI to an iron lung and have it decide how much oxygen to be, to, to be presented. We cannot take the information that the system is giving us and be absolutely diagnostic with it. It is a pre-diagnostic system. It's meant to be a second opinion. It's classified as a biofeedback device. Now, what does this mean? 
The definition of biofeedback is measuring a physical response and feeding it back to the patient. Thus, the scale in our bathroom becomes a biofeedback device, as we now can measure a physiological response, our weight. It increases our awareness. But awareness is not just conscious. There's also an unconscious awareness. So as we use a biofeedback device that can now intimately measure electrical changes in the body at a high degree, but not perfect degree, of accuracy, the biofeedback device can be used for stress diagnosis and for stress therapy. This is what biofeedback is for. In fact, biofeedback around the uh, around the world, as well as in the United States, is basically done by an awful lot of unlicensed practitioners. It is deregulated. Why? Because it has a softer degree of accuracy, and it has a very soft type of therapeutics. Stress diagnosis and stress therapy. So what does our device do? Our device is not designed for a cancer diagnosis, infectious diagnosis. It's designed to give us hints, ideas, possibilities, probabilities, because these are quantum probabilities. We don't know why the patient reacts to something. We have to determine with more tests, more thinking. The system is designed for stress, stress detection, stress reduction. That's what the system does. That is the broad-based idea of how the system is registered as a biofeedback device, capable of working with the patient to detect their stress, and to treat their stress. Stress comes in many different ways, and the system generates lots of different probabilities of what are the causes of stress that we can discuss with our patient, looking for additional validities and different ways of checking it. But in general, what the system has done, what we claim the system does, is help us deal with the stress of the patient. Now, we've mentioned the idea of a cybernetic loop. Let's explain a little bit more. Back in 1989, I was able to register the first zeroid system, known as the EPFX device. And this was through the company Eclosion. And I was able to register that with the FDA in America. It was a diagnostic device capable of measuring different channels, up to 10 different complete channels of changes in the body. And it was diagnostic. In 1990, I was then able to register a different device, known as the SCIO device, with the FDA, and it was therapeutic. It was able to generate different therapies along the idea of TENS, Trans-Electrical Nerval Stimulation, T-E-N-S, TENS. This was a variation of the Mora device, variation of the Rife device, a variation of the TENS devices, and basically was using a therapeutic mode. Well, in 1991, I had gone to the FDA and now said I wanted to combine. These were both registered devices, and I wanted to combine the two of them in one device and make a device that was capable of diagnosing energetic disturbances in the body and then one that was able to correct them. A device that might be able to correct brainwave, correct Alzheimer's, correct different things. 1991, the FDA said no. I said, why not? They said they don't have to answer that question. So I didn't know what to really do. See, the old style e uh, eclosion device, the device known as Phasix today, is only a diagnostic device. It does not have the therapy. It was an archaic device. In 1992, I had come to Hungary, and by working with the Hungarian officials, they said, what a wonderful idea. A diagnostic device combined with a TENS device. A device that could measure disturbance in the brainwave and then correct it. A device that would be able to measure electrical disturbances in the body electric and correct it at biological speeds. They said how we might be able to cure many mental diseases, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, many other different things, minimizing the cost of or the need of drugs in the patient, a very more, much more natural energetic type of medicine. So we were able to register the device in Hungary, and it has a cybernetic loop where we can now measure the body with the computer, and the computer can treat the body, 
And since the computer's speed is in the uh, uh, a minimum of 200 megahertz, we can see that the computer has very much time to be able to intervene with the body at every millisecond uh, of speed. And the ionic exchange rate in the human body is around a hundredth of a second. So as different changes are happening in our body electric, as we are responding to the, our, our environment, we do so in about a hundredth of a second. And the device with the cybernetic loop would be able to regulate different processes and pro help to promote health and biological resonance. Now, electron transport is basically the factor of how we're going to be able to reproduce, how we're going to be able to metabolize, how we're going to be able to transport energy. Energy can come in many different ways. One is charge electron transport. Another is heat, photons. Viscosity is an exchange of energy. We're also going to see the transfer of mass as energy, gravitation, etc. Many of these factors of energy transport, etc. But let's talk about the one that's most specific to life, the idea of charge and electron transport. As we take in the oxygen, the electrons inside the oxygen in their valence stages are going to be able to supply us the energy in the development of the ATP. In the presence of oxygen, we're going to be able to take glucose, which also has hot electrons. The glucose molecule is going to have about 18 hot electrons in it. Hot electrons because they are at high energy states. These high energy states of the electrons are going to be able to be, with oxygen, converted into, eight, uh, converted into 18 ATPs. Without the oxygen, we're only going to be able to make two of the adenosine triphosphates, or the ATP. So oxygen is key to life and to energy, etc., as well as is the sugar, uh, the glucose, which is best taken from fructose, from our fruit sugars because it's most compatible with the human body. The, so as energy now is being transmitted to do any of the different functions of the, of the body, muscles, which are a magnetic action, a magnetic energy, where the hot electrons are converted into magnetic energy, and the, the bits of muscles are magnetically pulled across each other. We're going to find that in our digestive process, that as the food is broken up in the stomach, brought into the small intestine. There's an electrical attraction that needs fiber for the brush border effect. And we're going to be able to absorb our nutrients because of an electrical process, a process of charge transfer, etc., as we absorb and utilize our nutrients. These electron transports then are going to be able to set through the body, creating the energy. As we said under QED phenomena, every time an electron changes its position, its energy state, there is a photon. If the electron is going to a higher energy state, the photon is brought in. If the electron is going to a lower energy state, then the electron is given out. This is one of the res responsibilities, as that the electrons in the human body are going to be sent out, or the photons in the human body, are going to be sent out in the ranges of body heat. Infrared, visible light, a touch of visible light, a touch of the UV, just a small bit. But the body is actually going to be sending out this type of information. This is needed for us to live as it is a byproduct of our existence, the electron transport chains. So if we want to start measuring the body electric, we want to be able to measure the body electronic. And the body electronic will reflect the body photonic. As the, one of the, di the laws of the QED is that they must work simultaneously. So thereby, our electrical measures of the body will be able to tell us about the processes of the body. Now, let's take a look at the mineral kingdom. I want to talk about the energy states. When we have the nucleus of an atom, and we have electrons orbiting around it, we'll give a number of electrons into this item, at different orbital states, different, different types of, of areas, the energy in the electrons will reflect their quantic energy. 
as an electron, as a photon will come in from the outside, photons will hit the electron and drive it to a, and make a quantum jump and it will go into a higher energy state. If we look into the minerals of the earth, right in the dirt, in the cliffs, etc., we're going to find that the basic rule of the mineral kingdom is ionic bonding. There is an ionic bond. As an example, if we take mineral salt, NaCl, we're going to find out here that the chlorine has an electron that the sodium wants. Thereby, the sodium and the chlorine will come together because the chlorine has something that the, the sodium wants, the electron, wants to share it. Now, this ionic bonding means that they just come very close, and this is what happens in the mineral kingdom. The electrons in the sodium and in the chlorine and the outer shell electrons are at low energy states, meaning that they are at very small orbitals, low energy states. These low energy state electrons in the sodium and the chlorine mean that they will not completely share the electron. They just hang out together. One has the electron, the extra electron, and one needs that electron. So they hang out together, ionic bonding. This is the key of the mineral kingdom. We drop this into water and they dissociate because ionic bonding is weak. It's of low energy. Now, when a plant absorbs the mineral, and what do plants do? Plants put down their roots and absorb minerals. The plant kingdom is designed to be able to take these minerals into it. Now, the plant then uses light, uses the photon energy of light to gradually build up the energy of the different atoms until in the plant kingdom they form a sigma bond which is a covalent bonding. In the covalent bonding now they don't just hang out together they actually share that electron. The electron can now get into an orbital state around the two of them. And when we take the sodium and chlorine, the, or the, the bond, the sigma bond, that now is being made inside the plant, when we drop the plant into water, it does not dissociate because the covalent bond is a high energy bond. It's much more strong. This is the fact because of the higher energy state. Now, the plant kingdom is thereby food for the animal kingdom. As animals, we are not meant to, to eat minerals. We don't plant our feet into the dirt. We don't stick our tongues into the dirt for lunch. We don't do this because we are meant to take our minerals, covalent bonding. We also call this a chelated bond. That's why the new rage is to everybody to get chelated minerals because they're more appropriate for the animals. The, the mineral bond of, let's say, calcium carbonate taken out of the mineral of the earth does not go into proper nutrition. It's of too low an energy. The body will have to spend energy to make that calcium appropriate. And it, might, it has to take the energy away from other factors of life. So covalent energy of plants, the plant kingdom is food for the animal kingdom. The animal kingdom can also be food for the animal kingdom because covalent bonds are now found in the plant and the animal. Higher energy, higher energy, and as a plant or an animal will die, its energy forms will return back to the mineral states as the energy is lost in its fight. So this is one of the ideas of how it, we will find that sodium is not always the same. There can be millions and millions and millions of different types of sodium, depending on the type of energy states and the electron structures. And these energy states can vary widely. And there is a small band which is most appropriate for nutrition. And nutrition should come from the plants. And the plants and the light process have the ability to construct the proper nutrition for the body. The synthetic chemicals, which uh, often apply ionic bonding, or 
inappropriate covalent bonding are not compatible. All of the synthetic compounds, the experiments have failed. The synthetics are not compatible with the human body. They are not tasty. They are not healthy. We have had trouble with all of these different synthetics. Nature knows in its complexity of dealing with metabolism and reproduction. Nature knows how to make nutrition for us in the animal kingdom. Now, as we discuss entropy versus negentropy, entropy means kind of a randomness. I don't believe anything is truly random. But in, in entropy, we talk about how like the air molecules in the room are in a type of entropy, dancing about in an uncontrolled fashion. Applying the laws of thermodynamics. If we have my, my hot coffee cup here, in the colder air of the room, the, what we find is that the heat from the coffee cup must be transferred to the cold air of the room. This is a law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. The second law of thermodynamics is that heat must flow from a hot body to a cold body. These are the laws of entropy, the laws of thermodynamics. Whereas in negentropy, something works inside biology, inside a living thing, that fights against entropy. So the heat in our bodies is not escaping to the room where our bodies are cooling down. We are transferring energy, but our bodies are making energy to maintain a difference in temperature between me and the room. I'm fighting against entropy. Entropy is the laws of thermodynamics, and these are the laws of death. If a person should die, as the man from the uh, famous reporter from the Washington Post once said, as a person dies, he says, they lose their battle against room temperature. Because life is a battle against room temperature. Life is organized in a different way, negative entropy or organization, and we're going to find that it of follows the laws of quantum physics. It is quantic. It has a different type of energy to it. We're going to have to explain quantic here in a minute. But as we go into thermodynamics, we're going to find out that these are all the laws of death. These are the, what happens when we test items in vitro, meaning in a test tube. When we test items in vitro, we are testing items in a thermodynamic way. This is what, how most of the synthetic chemicals are developed. They'll find something that works. They'll find an herb or a plant, a sea plant, new exciting research of sea plant and cancer. And they'll find that it works. It has an organization. It has a negative entropy. Then they'll want to synthesize in vitro or synthetically duplicate the chemical, making sure that the calcium's in the right spot and the nitrogen, etc not paying any attention to the electron in the orbitals and their energy states, because there are many, many secrets here in biology, many secrets here in life, following a quantic type connection. As we take a look at it, we're going to have, want to organize our understanding of biology in a different way. We want to start understanding how our bodies fight against entropy. Because the fight, the aging process is a gradual decay of our negative entropy. As the skin cells and the body cells and the hormone development all start to lose their ability to be precise and controlled and they start to gain more randomness and more entropy, they start to gain more thermodynamics. The laws of thermodynamics are the laws of death. We cannot build our chemistry our biology, our medicine. We cannot build this on the laws of death. We must start looking for in vivo research. We must start looking for working with the body, working with plants, working with different items in healing through natural mechanisms. Only natural mechanisms can truly work. When I went to pharma, uh, pharmacy school, took classes in medical school and pharmacology, and the very, very first lecture, the professor stood up and said, to use a synthetic anything is an insult to the body. To use a synthetic drug, 
a synthetic vitamin, a synthetic vitamin C, a synthetic B6, a synthetic anything is an insult to the human body. Next thing he said was, we're going to spend the rest of the semester learning how to insult the body, as nothing else was ever made of the natural items or the natural medicine. But yet, natural medicine does not insult the body. Natural medicine can be made more harmonic, more, more equanimous, more helpful, with less side effects, and oftentimes greater results. So we want to start to look at a different thing. We need to be able to develop our medicine in vivo, not in vitro. We need to be able to get back to the grassroots, as that only nature truly knows. Now, I want to talk about the Heisenberg uncertainty equation. And this is something that's been the basis of quantum theory for many years, and something nobody's been able to get around. What Heisenberg said is as we find things inside the world that we deal with with our conscious mind, in our actions, we find that there's a Newtonian type physics that everything seems to deal with. But if we're going to be making brake pedals for our car, we deal with the Newtonian type physics. But as our experiments get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, at a certain level, which he defined mathematically, all of a sudden the new thermodynamics, Newtonian physics, do not fit. It has to be interpreted by then uh, quantum physics. If we have the circle, a phosphorescent circle here the be at the front of our television set, and if we are sending off an electron to hit that, the electron has an indeterminacy set by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If we know the distance, the time, and the mass and put our calculation, we will find the amount of action or the Heisenberg type of action, the uncertainty action, inside this electron. Even a baseball will have an uncertainty if we put in the large mass, etc. But what we're going to find is that it's very large uh, type of number, very, very small uncertainty, tiny, tiny bit of uncertainty with a baseball. However, with the electron, it has a rather large uncertainty compared to the size of the electron. If the target is bigger than the uncertainty, then we have a thermodynamic event. So if we want to make our television, the electron going off to the target, it will hit the target. If we, know that if we build the, si the system to thermodynamic specs. What if we were to try to target a smaller phosphorescent dot? If the phosphorescent dot was underneath the indeterminacy, in other words, if we don't know, then we cannot use the laws of thermodynamics to build this system. We'll have to apply something else. This system would be impossible to build if we wanted to make that small of a system. Now let's take Another example, if we want to build a watch, if we want to build a watch, we have a very tiny watch, we want to be able to build it, and we know the size and the mass, and let's say the mass is 10 to the minus uh, 5 kilograms or etc., and we know the distance of the parts and how they're going to move, and that's just a, a tiny uh, a fraction of a centimeter. And the time is about one second. If we put this into the system, we will see that the action of our watch even a very small watch can come down to 10 to the minus 15th. Since this is larger than Planck's constant, if we want to build the watch, we will now use the laws of thermodynamics because the action of our events are larger than Planck's constant. Planck's constant allows us to calculate the indeterminacy of an event. Very interesting how this all works out mathematically and how Heisenberg is able to intuit this. Heisenberg found out this, and this has absolutely been something that people have not been able to circumvent. It is not the limitations of our equipment that determines the uncertainty. It's the limitations of the physical universe. Now, if we take the synaptic cleft of the human brain, and we know that, says that the synaptic cleft, we used to think of it as an electrical spark but now we know it's a neurotransmitter. And a neurotransmitter is released and then absorbed on the other side in a receptor site.
If we know the dimensions of the size about an angstrom, the width of the synaptic cleft, if we know that the mass, the size of acetylcholine, is a typical type of neurotransmitter, and we know that the time of the event, the transmitting of this event, if we put it into our action, we're going to see that the action of the synaptic cleft has an action of 10 to the minus 29th. And oh my God, medicine's just changed. The synaptic cleft is not a thermodynamic event. The synaptic cleft is a quantic event. It's not determined by precise thermodynamic scientific exchange. What did we say about quantum? Remember, quantum has a quantity. Well, of course, as we've said about the synaptic cleft, the synaptic cleft either fires or it doesn't. It's a quantic event. The neurotransmitter, when received, either fires or it does not fire. So it's a quanta event. Number two, it has a vibrational component, but number three, most impor importantly, it is uncertain, and thereby, number four, is it affected by the mind, and thereby a consciousness is the synaptic cleft. It's a quantic event affected by the mind and consciousness, and oh my God, pharmacology just went out the window. The only way pharmacology works is when we put in a very large quantity of mass, we drive the action back up into thermodynamics, back up into unnatural events. Pharmacology only works because we put in massive quantities. We do not put in natural quantities of these different neurotransmitters or something like the neurotransmitters. Uh, we use a mescaline because it's like a serotonin or a blocking, etc. But what happens is we accelerate the mass, we drive it out of natural. Pharmacology doesn't work. It can only sedate symptoms. It cannot help people. If we want to understand the human brain, if we want to understand the biology, we're going to have to realize that the basic form of connection of the synaptic cleft is a quantic event and must be understood in quantum principles. And now medicine has dramatically changed. And medicine must now walk the planks constant, as I've said in my books. We need to be able to look at a different type of form, as that now in everything that we know about the brain is now archaic. We need to go back and study everything with a different set of rules. Rupert Sheldrake had an idea of morphic resonance, shape resonance that as something would take shape in the world, a brand new chemical, a brand new element, a brand new idea, that this would have the shape would resonate into the world. Also called the hundredth monkey effect because they found that monkeys were washing food after a hundred of them started doing it, got contagious. Monkeys on other, plant, on other islands were doing it as well. This morphic resonance is very interesting. He rationalized that if, the, as we know, the synaptic cleft of the human brain is actually a quantic event, and that if we could match the resonance of the human brain, because if we have the, the, the I Ching coins, we have 64 possibilities. The probability of throwing the I Ching coins. We ask a question, throw the coins. The human brain, however, in its indeterminacy, has 10 to the 23rd synaptic clefts. If we could build a machine that could match the indeterminacy of the human brain, could we then build a morphic resonance device that would go past the I Ching ability to connect and be able to connect at a much higher level? This, is the, this machine is known as the QXCI. So taking this device, we've now been able to allow the computer to transist and for it to generate a morphic resonance indeterminacy matrix matching that of the human brain, matching that of the human consciousness, allowing us to interact and get connections at the subspace level. This is just one of the simple functions of the QXCI. If a person is not attached to the harness and is is shifts to virtual mode. It works through this mode. Also through morphic resonance, maybe now understand factors of prayer. 
could we understand the idea of the connection of prayer? 330 quality studies done at many different universities have shown that people who are prayed for have a chance, a, a, a significant chance of getting better versus those who are not prayed for. Prayer has an effect. Prayer can help people. Scientifically proven. How does this happen? Except through some morphic resonance or subspace connection of consciousness and caring and compassion. As there are certain types of prayers that seem to work better than others. Very interesting. Now, if we take the prayer and go into the Tibetan prayer wheel idea, where they took an inanimate object, put a prayer onto it, and would then spin the object, allowing the prayer to repeat They've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years, and they swear by it. Could we not take the inanimate object of the computer and make it into a prayer wheel, allowing it to have prayers that would spin infinitely in the hard drive as we work with the patient, and allow these prayers to interact into the morphic resonance and interact into the actual consciousness? Can we give the QXCI, which is known as the quantum zeroid consciousness interface, because it has a consciousness type of interface with the patient. Designed with its prayers to focus into the quality, dissipate the karma, intensify the ability for us to diagnose, and intensify the ability for us to do therapy. So that's one of the ideas we've done with the QXCI, is to add a type of morphic resonance subspace connection. Let's go into that observer effect a little bit more. Let's talk about what I call subspace. One of the studies that was done on psychic phenomena that's outlined in our book is how they took uranium ore, which is decaying. The decay of the uranium ore was at a quantic level because of the size of the atoms of the uranium. In other words, it was indeterminate. It was a quantum event, not a thermodynamic event. The Geiger counter was put placed to be able to count the amount of radiation coming off. The Geiger counter was moved back and forth to a distance where there was a probability of one second for the next uranium uh, energy, the radioactive next radioactive energy, to strike the Geiger counter. This was set and precisely set approximately to be around that one second area was set to run by itself for months so that they would establish it. Then a person was involved, the subject, who was then put into a room with the clock. The clock was set so that if the uh, next radiation from the uranium ore was greater than one second, it would go one space clockwise. If the next one was less than one second, it would go one space counterclockwise. If it was exactly one second, it would stay stationary. The person was then told, with their mind, to try to influence the clock and try to get the hand of the clock to move clockwise. As, this, as the persons went into it, everybody was able to do it. There was an effect that the human brain, which is a quantic event, was able to influence, indirectly, but influence the uranium d decay, which is a quantum event. These two are interacting to each other, and one quantum event can influence another quantum event, and this does not seem to have any particle connections. It seems to be independent of space and time and distance. And it happens through what I feel is an idea of subspace, an ideal of what I call another expression of Carl Jung's collective unconscious, that at one level we still exist as one thing. As Einstein said, the universe is still one thing. We only have the illusion that we are separate. The mental illusion of separateness. And our goal in life is to enlarge our circle of compassion until it surrounds all things. A quantum event can influence a quantum event. This is what the observer effect was found in quantum theory. As we got into a quantum study, the mind of the observer influenced. If we get into the medical study, because it's quantum event. The quantum event influences the patient, influences the study. So thereby it was undeniable that there was an effect of mind influencing. Recent studies showed where one researcher found that in his idea,
His observing of patients on a television did not affect the patient, where his co-worker believed that she could affect the patient. They set up an identical study where one where they were both going to observe their patients, unknown to the patient. The patient did not know when they were being observed. And the woman who believed that she could affect her patient did. The man who did not believe did not. Thereby the mind somewhat was connected. We find definitely a connection of the subspace, that there is an effect of consciousness and the mind can influence these things. It seems to influence a quantic event very, rare, very readily, where it is not going to influence a non-quantic event. Moving the pencil is very difficult because the pencil movement is a thermodynamic event. This can happen if the, enough energy can be taken into the quantum level of the electrons and protons and molecules and move it quantically. Very, very difficult. But if the ex a simple experiment is set up with a quantum, such as throwing the I Ching coins, etc., there's an effect. Las Vegas is built on this because people know when they start to do gambling, they have some ability. It seems like that ability then declines after a bit, but just before they leave, the ability comes back. So there's an effect. That's why people gamble, because they recognize that there is something. Every society in the world has developed a way of looking at something which should have been ignored, such as the, the tea leaves, lines in the hand, yarrow, card, uh, yarrow sticks, the I Ching coins, tarot cards, etc. All of these different things which, appear, which in one level appear to the mind, the scientific mind, to be not connected, now found to be connected is that there is a subspace unity of consciousness that we all enjoy. Okay, let's talk about uh, unified field theory. What we're trying to describe here is that inside the world of physics, we know that there's a force of electrodynamics, which seems to be fairly well understood. We know that there's a force of mass, etc. We know that there's a force inside a nucleus. There's a small force of the nucleus, the large force of the nucleus, things that organize uh, the different energy. We know that there's a basic energy of the universe itself. We know that there's gravity. We know that there's consciousness. And we want to try to find one basic theory that will allow us to understand all of these different forces. A unified field theory. Basically, this has been uh, attempted by many people, and the closest form that is accepted today is that of the QED. The quantum electrodynamics offers us a type of a unified field theory. However, there are certain things it does not explain. Inside the book of the Promorpheus, I offer a little bit of a, of a unified field theory, where uh, taking the, because we want to try to understand that of gravity. What is gravity? And we know that the basic formula for gravity is gravity uh, has the effect of two masses, mass one plus mass two, over their distance. Um, distance squared, uh, however, and as we take two different items and we move them further and further apart, it's the inverse square law of the amount of gravity that applies between the two. This is times the gravitational constant, and the gravitational constant as we know it is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 8th dynes, a basic constant uh, that describes how mass attracts each other. So if we know the mass of two different items, we can calculate the gravity or the pull between it. It takes uh, the entire mass of the planet Earth to make one quart of water weigh a, weigh a kilo. So that tells you, that's what um, the, uh, Isaac Newton had remarked. So we can see that this is really a very weak force, but yet a very strong force in our lives. Now, if we want to find a unified field theory, we also know that from Einstein's equation, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. But it, to complete Einstein's original equation, we have to add in the idea of a velocity. The faster we move towards the speed of light, the more we approach an unattainable, uh, infinite amount of energy. So we have to put this underneath to really make the, the equation complete. Many people will just put E equals mc squared. But if we don't put in the velocity variable, we really don't get the complete uh, description as Einstein uh, had given it to us. If we transpose this and 
put the mass on one side, we're going to find mass equals the energy times the square root of 1 minus the velocity, our velocity squared, over the velocity of light squared, all over the velocity of light squared. So we get our mass equation by simply transposing this. So now we have mass equals. So now let's take mass 1, mass 2, and let's put this into our equation in terms of mass, now in terms of energy, as we have in this equation here. Now we have gravity will equal the energy times the inverse uh, or the square root of 1 minus our velocity with respect to the speed of light, and also the mass 2 over here on this side. So this, we have plus these two different masses in terms of energy uh, over the distance squared uh, plus the speed of light squared. So now we can understand a little bit more of this. And as we break this down, if we, then we find that gravity, if we uh, break in all the different, put in this, what we know the speed of light is, let's put our velocity down at basically zero So you know, for the simple understanding. We're going to find that the basic energy of gravity is going to be po uh, uh, 0.74 times 10 to the minus 27th divided by the joules. Now, if we substitute in for the mass, the mass, what we know of the photon, the real photon having a mass, and we substitute that in, we're going to find that the photon has 10 to the minus 61, uh, uh, 61 bits of energy per beat. We can see that photons indeed do have gravity, and this will allow us an idea to help us to totally understand the capacities of a unified field theory. Now, what I offer as an explanation is that the virtual photon, which even has a little bit less mass, that the virtual photon is a reflection of the consciousness of the universe, and that this is the basic form of consciousness of the universe. And our unified field theory, we come down to a description where consciousness is the variable that allows us to understand all other types of forces in the universe. And if we start to understand the consciousness, we will start to expand our unified field theory. Now, many people ask, what is measured by the QXCI? Just what is the QXCI doing? Well, we're trying to take an energetic medicine measure of the body. We're trying to understand the basics. And the basics of the electronics is we understand the volts, which is the pressure behind current. We understand the amps. We want to understand the resistance. Many archaic or uh, old-style types of energetic medicine systems only used resistance. Many of them only used temperature. Some use resistance and temperature. And temperature is indeed uh, another variable. But what we found in our measures is that resistance and temperature were the least quality measures, the least accurate. That the most accurate measures in measuring the body energetic was the voltage and the amperage. This is a true reflection of the ionic exchange or the amount of electrons, protons, charged particles that are exchanging. Because this is the amount of them is an amperage, and the push behind them is a reflection of the voltage. So as we take a look at this, we're going to find voltage and amperages are key. Voltage and amperage will now will reflect changes in temperature because of the QED phenomena, as we've described. So our electrical measures, using very sensitive amplifiers, we can now hook up electrodes to the body. If we hook up electrodes of dissimilar metals, using a special metal on the head and a special carbon type of, of uh, element on the wrist, which is impregnated into the rubber, a very highly conductive substance, that these two dissimilar metals will create an electropotential with the waters of, of the body in the middle, the electrolyte being the human body. The strength of the electrolyte will increase the strength of the signal. So now we're able to take this and amplify it through a series of different amplifiers and get voltage measures, amperage measures, and resistance measures of the human body. A very sophisticated process. Now we're going to take in our raw measures, which include uh, six from the head and four from the, uh, from the different um, um, extremities. And we're going to get at what we call our real measures. Now since we have a computer, the computer's going to be able to measure these things very rapidly. The computer is also going to be able to calculate. Once we make a, uh, the idea of a voltage and an amperage, volts times amps equals watts, or power.
So this is what we call a virtual measurement. We can measure the wattage of the brain or different areas. Only with a volt or an amp, as volts and amps change, can we measure frequency. The old style devices that measure only resistance cannot measure frequency. You cannot measure the frequency of an item with an ohmmeter or a resistance device. You can only measure the frequency of items by measuring voltage and amperage, different changes of this style. So now we can measure frequencies. We can calculate changes. We can measure frequencies. We can measure the delta factor of volts and the delta factor of amps, giving us an idea of the qualities of the body. We're going to measure this at different, uh, different parts. We're going to measure also different uh, items inside the body. The changes of volts is going to tell us capacitance. The changes in amps is going to give us an inductance correlation through a mathematical virtual measure. So now we can get capacitance or static uh, re reflections of the body, inductance or magnetic changes of the body. We're going to be able to measure susceptance another electrical term, the susceptibility of the system to response to electrical changes, as well as the reactance. And the reactance is basically uh, found through a formula of change in capacitance, inductance, and resistance. So as we start to study, the computer's going to be able to measure 55 different variables every thousandth of a second to every hundredth of a second. As it checks with the system and be able to see these different measures in the body. So what the system is measuring is a very complex form of 55 different channels of electrical information and how it changes very rapidly at very rapid speeds. When I first developed the e old eclosion system, it made four uh, channel four actual channels and calculated only 10 different variables from there. These 10 variables were also very limited and they were frozen at a certain period of time which was only about one-fourth of a second. So we had a very, very an antique system, a system that really could not do therapy and diagnosis at the same time, hence the cybernetic loop of the QXCI. But here, what is measured is 55 different variables of varying forms of the voltage and amperage changes, allowing us to detect frequencies, susceptance, reactance, capacitance, and inductance, as well as other different changes inside the body electric. What do I mean by the accounting of life? As we have developed one cell, the cell will have to be able to interact with its environment. Our definition, our simplest definition of life, how do we define what is alive versus what isn't? We're going to have to say that a living thing will have to be able to metabolize on its own, metabolize into its environment, be able to absorb nutrition and excrete different uh, toxins, etc. It will also have to be able to reproduce on its own, meaning that we'll have to be able to synthesize a new entity from itself. So this type of reproduction versus metabolism will define life. Now, inside the cell, it must be an accounting system to be able to deal with other elements that it meets. The cell, made of chemicals, will have to be able to deal with the photon energy of coming into it in the way of light, ultraviolet, heat, etc. It will have to be able to deal with the electrons that it that it is exposed to, electrical charges in the atmosphere, it will have to be able to deal with nutrition, meaning other different molecules. It will have to find these, use them. As it meets them, it's going to find different energies of the electrons. The electrons in the orbital states of the oxygen, uh, inside the carbon, inside our nutrition, will then be utilized by the system to define its own energy. That's the theory of metabolism. As it utilizes this energy in the form of oxygen, let's say, for respiration, it will then produce a toxin, basic system of life. In the human being, we take in oxygen, we give out carbon dioxide. In a chemical process that has to be guided through a process of metabolism. Counter to that, we also have to be able to reproduce. Now, the responsibility of metabolism is virtually a very large responsibility 
because we have to be able to respond to a wide, wide, wide variety of environments. We have to be able to respond to different temperatures, different types of nutrition. We have to be able to respond to the fact that much of what we eat is not digestible. Much of what we eat is not good for us. We will encounter substances that we will need to deal with. So metabolism has to be wide open or very, very large in its mathematical constraints. Very wide open with many degrees of freedom mathematically. However, reproduction will have to have very little. It has to have much more control for us to be able to reproduce. Because if we're going to, if a species is going to be able to exist, it has to be able to minimize the faults of reproduction. It has to be able to make sure that there's less than one million, uh, one millionth of a chance. That would be absurd. Actually, one ten million or even a hundred millionth of a chance of there being a mutation. So the reproduction quality has to be very, very, very controlled. DNA has provided the ability of the reproduction ability to be very specific and very controlled. DNA and the RNA and etc. in connection with our nutrition is also very open in its ability to develop the metabolism. The combined vector of these two is what we call the epigenesis. And the epigenesis is a combining of metabolism and reproduction, basically a joint togetherness because each will infringe on the other because they are working together. Reproduction should be done at a small percentage as we 6% of our energy should be, dis the, should be into reproduction, whereas a large amount of our energy has to be de dedicated 90% plus of our energy has to be guided into metabolism. If this changes and more of the energy starts going into reproduction, that's one of the things that happens with cancer. Cancer cells start to reproduce, they start to grow, and they start to use more energy in their reproduction. So we can see cancer is actually a shift of the natural energy from metabolism to reproduction. That's just one explanation for cancer. So the accounting system of life is how, just how does the the bacteria, the fungus, the living cells of the human being, how would, do they interact with environment? How do they interact with themselves to reproduce, etc.? What is the factors of life? And this all has to be done at a mathematical level of exchanging a type of energy from an electron that has a certain type of range. If the electron has too much energy, it could be harmful. If the electron has too little energy, it could be harmful. You see? So we have to have just the right amount of mathematical ability to know how to interact with our environments. There are certain places we can't go, with certain temperatures we can't tolerate, etc., because we know the limits of the mathematic tolerance of our life. We've known this from experience. This helps to set the tone, and as we understand more of the mathematical connection, not just in reproduction, as that much of, much of science is looking into DNA and genes, etc., without looking into the open quality of the quantic nature of the metabolism. We need to understand more of the complete organism to be able to understand ourselves and to understand our quantum biology. Now, what is the accuracy of the QXCI device? Many people ask about this. In modern medicine, in order to get something to be credentialed to work, you have to understand that modern medicine's therapies, that the therapies used by modern medicine are items like chemotherapy or harsh drugs, surgery, uh, radiation, these type of different factors. Why? Well, because modern medicine is positioned in a crisis care, trying to save lives or save people from dying, the crisis, crisis care. If these are your weapons or your therapies, then you want your diagnosis to be very accurate and a minimum of 98% type of accuracy to be able to get the what we call significance so that it's very, very sure that you have the right diagnosis. In cancer, you want 99.9% .9 that you're sure. That means the cancer is going to have to be about that big. But 10 million cells. You have to make sure that it's there before you activate one of your therapies. Now, what if your therapies 
were more natural. What if instead of the modern medicine harsh crisis care, what if we made our medicine more soft? What if we made our medicine instead of crisis care more early preventative? If we tried to just catch the very earliest part of the disease? What if our therapies were homeopathy, gentle homeopathy, nutrition? What if our, we had vitamins? different glandulars? What if our, if our therapies included exercise? What if our therapies included meditation or stress reduction? What if we had massage adjustment? What if we had nice soft therapies? Do we need 98% accuracy? Because when we start to measure the body electric, we're going to find there's a wide variety of different reactions. There's interference from the environment, of course. There's also interference from the muscular, uh, musculoskeletal structure of the patient. In order for us to make a system that we didn't have to put into a Faraday cage or make a system that would have a retail of $200,000 or so, I decided if I softened the statistic down to 85% as the minimum value, we calibrate to the patient and the machine once calibrated to the patient, if it is not a minimum of about 85% calibration, then the machine will not be able to do the patient. The machine will have to say, no, I can't do this patient. Because we need at least this in our diagnostic. But with this comes some errors. Now, because we can be 15% wrong, that's one person in 10 even more, you know. So we have to look at this and have to think to ourselves, if our interventions are soft, what would happen if we made a mistake? The person might buy a homeopathic or a nutrition that they don't need. And if that's the case, could we make a softer statistic, a softer statistic of analysis for a more gentle system of therapy? Because when we get into energetic medicine, could we make an affordable device a device that could calibrate to this level and give us this degree of accuracy. But when we do this, we don't want to be compared to this standard. This is what many people would do. They will compare our instrument to the medical standard of 98 or 99.9% .9 effective in its diagnosis. And that's not really the theory. What we're saying is we've made a more gentle system and a system that has a much more uh, the chance of mistakes, meaning that the therapist now has to be involved and the therapist must think. I know that might be a dirty word. But now we can't make systems at this level of diagnosis that will take out the need for the doctor. We want to make systems that people will now have to think, what is the machine telling me? Is the machine telling me the right? How do I look for more validation. Can I use my machine as a pre-diagnostic device? Can I accept what the machine's telling me and then maybe challenge it with some other tests? And that's the beauty of the quantum zeroid consciousness interface.